welcome you back to Revelation's Thousand Year Holiday, and it's free. This is part two. What we're going to do, we'll do a little bit of review from what we talked about last in our part one of our presentation, then we'll launch into part two. So you remember in part one, we talked about Revelation 20, one through six. If you don't mind, let's go there just for a few minutes here. Cover that for those who weren't here for part one. All right, Revelation 20, and let's start with verse 1. Revelation 20 and verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and he had a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, that's a millennium, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. Now, I'm going to take a break there just for a moment. I want you to notice that he doesn't tempt anybody until the thousand years is finished. Well, what happens at the end of the thousand years? Well, all the wicked dead are resurrected a second time. Now he's got people to tempt. All right. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I want you to notice again here, he says, blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. Meaning, cursed are those who have a part in the second resurrection. And so be sure that you're a part of the first resurrection. And in part one, and by the way, if you miss part one, you can go look at that either on YouTube or on First Light or you can get the handout and you can see what it's talking about there. But we talked about the pit and uh, what that means. All right, so let's launch into um, the steps to the millennium, what happens before, during, and after the millennium. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer as we open our Bibles. Father in heaven, We're thankful for your love and your care for us, and I pray as we open the Bible now that your spirit will saturate our beings, saturate our mind especially, but even our bodies. And Father, we want to dedicate these next few minutes to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So you'll remember in part one, and this is just what we read from Revelation 20 and verses one through six. So you have the second coming of Jesus. The saints are raptured. That is, they're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. This is called the first resurrection. The wicked are slain by the brightness of Jesus' second coming. And this is called the first death. The fowls feast on their carcasses. We read that in Revelation 19 in part one. And then a lake of fire is prepared for the beast and the false prophet. So this is what leads up to millennium and kicks off the millennium, the thousand years. And then during the millennium, the saints live and reign with Christ in heaven. They're judging. They're actually judging God's judgment. And I must say this, I must put it this way. It's not that we're going to change God's judgment. What it is, is that we align our own judgment with God's judgment. Oftentimes in the world right now, we look at God's judgment and we think that God is unfair. You ever said that? Now, most of us wouldn't say that out loud, but in our heart of hearts, we think, well, this is not right and God's not doing things the right way. What happens during the millennium is our judgment is actually lined up with God's judgment. So we're not judging God's judgment in the way that we can change it, but we're only shedding light on the rest of the universe that God is fair and wonderful in his judgment. And during the thousand years, Satan is bound 
in this world, it's all broken down. It's the bottomless pit, and he's got chains of circumstances. He's wandering all over the earth. And then he's, at the end of the thousand years of millennium, he's loosed for a short season, and we just read about that in Revelation 20. And then let's pick it up here in Revelation 21 and verse 8, and uh, in just a minute or two, we're going to go into part 2. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so for those who didn't see part one here, what we saw is that Satan is loose during this short season, and that's the resurrection of the wicked. And so there's billions and billions, maybe even trillions and trillions of wicked people who've been resurrected. The devil is deceiving them that they can go up against the city of God because the city of God has now come down from heaven, that is the new Jerusalem, landed on uh, the mount and it split in two. And then God is establishing his city here on the earth. And the wicked go up and surround the camp of the saints, the Bible says, and they think they're going to take it. Satan has rallied all these people together, and he says, I'm going to be like the Most High. He inspires the wicked, and uh, he says, my kingdom of darkness, come and rally with me to take it. And um, at this very point... I want to pause for a moment. This is literally going to be the single most awesome moment in Earth's history. Every single one of you are either going to be on the inside of the city of God or on the outside. If you're on the inside of the city of God, the Bible says that the foundations of the city and the walls are transparent. They're different colored minerals and precious stones. And so you'll be able to see the wicked on the outside of the city of God. And the wicked on the outside are going to be able to look in and see you on the inside of the city of God. You have no choice. And uh, so those inside the city of God have just spent a thousand years in heaven, and they've seen no sin for that time. And Revelation 21, 18 says that the walls of the city are like clear glass. And then Psalms 91 and verse 8 says that with your eyes, you're going to behold and see the reward of the wicked. And I want you to think about this. Those on the outside of the city of God are going to realize that they blew it. They're going to say to themselves, I could have been on the inside. I could be with Jesus. I could be living for the rest of eternity with Jesus. But I made the choice to sin. I I chose the trinkets of sin instead of seeing Jesus and being with him. That's going to be horrible. And so having been in the city for a thousand years judging, we're going to say, oh God Almighty, we judge you as just and true. We used to live with this. God put an end to it. And there's going to be tears in people's eyes. I want you to notice the Bible says he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes, but that's not until the thousand years are finished. At this time, when the righteous are looking outside the city of God, there's going to be mothers who see sons or daughters or children who they put on the righteous path to heaven. But in some time, this child chose the path of wickedness. And that mother, that father is going to have tears in their eyes and say, son, daughter, why didn't you make this decision? Why didn't you follow Jesus? There's going to be children seeing their parents outside. It's going to be the most tremendous, horrific time. I believe even in God's eyes, there's going to be tears and wives and husbands are going to be separated by the wall. And they're going to wish to God that they'd made the choice to follow God and follow God only. Wish to God that they hadn't followed the commandments of men and the traditions of men. And so men and women, children, young people, I want you to think about that day. And I want you to contemplate that deeply right now. Because God is calling you to be a part of that. 
God's mercy and love and forgiveness is freely open to you right now. All you have to do is flee to the arms of Jesus and he will forgive and he will not allow you to stay in your sinful life. He will give you victory. And so the single most important question today is where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to be a lost fool in hell or are you going to be a saint who's in heaven? And people are going to be standing on the outside and realize that I chose 80 years of sin, I chose this world and its approval, and I lost it all. And Jesus is going to weep as he wept over Jerusalem. He's going to say, I gave you my son. Jesus who died for you, he took your place on Calvary. You could have been free of this death. I sent my Holy Spirit. And God with tears in his eyes, he's gonna say, my people, why did you choose this? I love you enough to let you have your own choice. I won't force you to love me. If you, I won't force you to be with me. If you love sin and sinners more than me, then there's only one choice for you. And so God honors the choice that they made. And it says that fire came down from God out of heaven and it devoured them. And so, we have the second coming, the saints are raptured, this is all what happens preceding the millennium. The thousand years, the saints live and reign with Christ in heaven, Satan is bound, and now we see the short season. So the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. This is the second resurrection. Now I've got a question for you, is this second resurrection the resurrection of the saints or of the wicked? It is of the wicked, that's exactly right. So the wicked attempt to take the city of God, hellfire comes down from God, this is called the second death. God recreates a new heaven and a new earth, and the best thing about the new earth comes from Isaiah 66, let's look at verse 22 and three from the screen here. It says, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Every Sabbath day, we're going to all go back to the new Jerusalem. And we may even think about our time down here on earth in the University of Waikato in the, in the S um, block and how we came together and God brought us together here. And some of us made the decision to follow Jesus all the way. And while we're living in that new Jerusalem, we're gonna go every single Sabbath day. We're gonna worship God together. Now folks, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, experienced the blessing of Sabbath worship, but I love Sabbath. It's my favorite day of the week. However, in the new Jerusalem, in heaven, there's gonna be billions and billions of people. Again, it says, as the sands of the sea. Can you imagine coming together and singing? What kind of a choir is that gonna be like? And they're not gonna have croaky voices like mine. If I sang for you right now, you would all leave, and uh, you would have a right to all leave. But we're all gonna have angelic voices, and every Sabbath day, we're gonna come together and worship the God and go to the new Jerusalem. We're gonna kneel at the feet of Jesus and we're gonna worship him and praise him and thank him that he's our God and savior every single Sabbath and you can be a part of that. I just wanna, before we close out here, I wanna talk uh, about the Bible in Leviticus. In Leviticus 16, God tells us what happens to Satan during the millennium using symbolic language of the sanctuary. And so for some of those who were here on the seminar I held, when we talk about the sanctuary, remember on the Day of Atonement that there were two goats brought before God. And there was a scapegoat and then the Lord's goat. Now I've got a question for you. If it was the Lord's goat that was sacrificed for the sins of the people, then the scapegoat was not the Lord's goat. Whose was that? Well, that was actually Satan's goat. And so it's very interesting here. The scapegoat pointed to Satan as the author of sin and therefore ultimately is punished for his role in this terrible sin experiment. 
So in Leviticus 16 and verse 8, it says that on one of the two goats was for the Lord and the other lot was for the scapegoat. All right, so that is Satan. And verse 10, and he said that the scapegoat was presented alive and let go into the wilderness. And verse 22, the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go of the goat in the wilderness. Now, this is an interesting prophecy in light of the millennium. Because these two goats, one was sacrificed for the Lord, so his throat was cut, they caught the blood, they took it into the sanctuary, and that made atonement for the people. Who did that represent? That represented Jesus Christ, didn't it? I want you to notice the other goat was taken out into the wilderness and he was let go without killing him, without dying. Well, that's an obvious reference to the millennium, isn't it? When Satan is let go out into the wilderness. And so, folks, as you go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can see a beautiful thread that goes through both of them. And as we understand the symbolism from the sanctuary and the Old Testament, it helps us to understand what God is telling us. All right, so the wilderness, of course, is the earth broken down during the thousand years. God says, Satan, um, I'm gonna let you go as the living goat in the wilderness. You live with their stinking, rotting bodies for a thousand years, and so Satan is actually stuck with that. Again, during the millennium, we're gonna be on thrones judging. I just wanna mention the judgment just for a few minutes here. Go back to that. The New Zealand Herald's Tracy Neal put out an article the other day addressing New Zealand judges titled Corrupt, Biased, Incompetent, Drunk Complaints about Judges Tally 1,262 People in Five Years Right Here in New Zealand and have jumped 45% since 2017 from people who claim the judge was either corrupt, biased, incompetent, drunk, or on drugs. So how many times have you thought that somebody in an authority position abused their authority or they did something that was terrible as far as justice is concerned? I know I can think of several instances myself where that happened. Well, folks, whenever something terrible happens here on the earth, and if you watch the news, I don't recommend you watch the news, but if you do, then you're gonna see how many injustices there are in this world, right? And you're gonna see where powerful people abuse their power and their authority. Can you imagine if you were an atheist? An atheist can only say, you know what? This is just how life happens. I'm never going to see equity. I'm never going to see fairness. Life is unfair and you die. That's the atheistic thinking, folks. But the millennium and the people, that is us who are put on the judgment throne, tells us that God is going to make everything perfect and right and fair one day. What do you say? And so I don't care how powerful that person was, I don't care if they were Hitler or Pol Pot or who they were, and how much they abuse people, how much they abuse their power, and how in unjust they were, God's going to make it right. And so do you have circumstances in your life right now? Do you have a past circumstance that haunts you? Well, I have a comforting thought for you. That thought is that one day during the millennium, God's going to make it right and you can just leave whatever's going on in your life, leave it in the hands of God. You know, there's a lot of things happening in my life, uh, have been happening, and um, people say to me, well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And, you, and I just say to them, you know what? My reputation is in God's hands. And my life is in God's hands. And if I chase down every single circumstance and situation where somebody backbit or somebody said something about me, I would have no peace in my life. But you know what? I have peace. You know why? Because God is in control. And ultimately, God's going to take care of all of this. What do you say? 
And many people believe that America is turning into a police state, or as Chris Siloso says, I propose that all responsibility state governments declare the leadership of the FBI has gone rogue. Some of you may know what's going on in America right now with the FBI and the CIA and that kind of thing. And so um, how do we know for sure? How do we know that a person in power is actually looking for justice? Or are they just playing politics? You know what the answer to that is? You don't. Nobody knows. Somebody asked me the other day about 9-11, 2001, the Twin Towers. Did I think it was an inside job or did I think it was an outside job? <laughs> you know what I answered that? I'm not gonna tell you what I answered. You know what, folks? My answer is nobody really knows, do they? We don't. Now, I've got my ideas, and I've got my theories about this, and then there's all the stuff about the vaccine and stuff. Folks, some people claim they know everything about everything, but you know what? God's gonna straighten it all out in the millennium. What do you say? And he'll, he'll make it all straight, and we can know that God is a God of justice, and everything he does is for our own good. I wanna tell you the story in closing. I wanna tell you about Emirates Palace in Dubai. The palace's holiday or vacation package starts with a first class trip to Dubai. The seven day all inclusive stay in one of the Emirates Palace's 2,000 square meter palace suites offers daily spa treatments. The package also includes three day trips by private jet to Iran where you're gonna have a Persian rug handmade to your specifications, then to the Dead Sea Jordan where you can have your spa treatment, and then to Bahrain for a deep sea driving experience. How much does it cost? Over $142,000 a day or $100 a minute with a total bill of a million dollars. Now that's a holiday, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but guess what, folks? Your mansion in heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare for you is gonna make that palace look like a doghouse because what God has for you is amazing. I want you to be there. I wanna be there. How about you? Amen. So let's make an appointment to be there and let's all say, you know what? With Jesus Christ and his great mercy, his great love and his great forgiveness, every single person can be there. Jesus wants to take his righteousness and trade it for your unrighteousness. And that is the great trade-off. And so when Jesus, or when God looks at us on day of judgment, he doesn't see you and your sinfulness, he sees Jesus and his righteousness. And God no longer judges you, but he judges Jesus inside of you. And so God can purify your heart and God can give you a clean heart and clean up your life. Let's all pray together as we finish this out. Father in heaven, we thank you for that beautiful promise of living in heaven with Jesus for the rest of eternity. Father, I pray that you will take all of our hearts and you'll help us to become what you want us to become. I know there may be some who are struggling right now in this congregation or who are watching on television. I pray you'll be with them in a very special way. Help them to give their lives to Jesus if they haven't done that yet. Father, we thank you. We look forward to that mansion in heaven, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.